you, Justin. Renita is beautiful. Would you pray with me? Father, my challenge right now is to surrender to you. And God, you know that's hard right now at this moment. And I pray that you would help me to be faithful to you and to speak the words that you want me to, to say and the congregation to hear. I pray that I'd be true to your text and that I'd be open to your spirit. That I'd be humble before you in this congregation and that you would uh, speak in powerful and life-altering ways. We give you glory right now. We surrender to you. In Jesus' great name, amen. You know, I was thinking about uh, solutions because we're moving on from talking about problems in marriage to solutions in marriage. So I started thinking about problems. And all of the things, uh, the problems that are left undone in my world right now because of pace of life and different things. And man, it started to be this list of uh, undone problems, uh, un unfinished uh, projects, you might say. Well, let me tell you what I mean. We have a bathtub that doesn't, doesn't drain, and we've tried every form of Drano, like every strength. We keep going up. I think we're going to eat a hole through the pipe, so we have to stop. And but it takes an hour to drain. I don't know what's wrong with it. I just know that it takes forever to drain. Or we have the van window on Kelly's side that still doesn't roll down. Well, it will roll down, but it will never roll back up apart from a pair of pliers. And you have to tell the people at Walmart when you're getting your oil changed not to roll that window down because they will roll it down. And then they just leave it that way. They don't come tell you, hey, I rolled your window down. It doesn't go back up. <laughs> so it's, you know, difficult. We got it back up, but it's difficult to go through a drive through with a window that doesn't roll down. Uh, there's all kind of things like that. Uh, it, there's, the, there's the air conditioner. That all seems to be car related, doesn't it? There's the air conditioner dial in my truck that's, that seems to be stuck on defrost and, and feet. So my feet are always hot or cold, and uh, my windshield is usually clear. But uh, sometimes I want the air blowing on me, and, and somebody told me what was wrong with that after the service. But I, I know the problems. I know, actually, I don't even know what's causing the problems. And most of the, I have an idea that there's probably a toy in the drain of our bathtub somehow that might have got stuck down there I don't know but I don't know really what's wrong with any of the things that are wrong I just know how they impact my life I know that it, it's difficult to to go through a drive-through in Kelly's van it's actually difficult to pick up the mail in Kelly's van uh, I know that uh, it takes a long time that we have to plan and for give forethought to two baths in a row in that upstairs bathroom and we need to fix some things but you know sometimes you just you learn to live with the the difficulty, even though it's a difficulty, and I think our marriages are sometimes like that. I think relationships are sometimes, we get used to a certain degree of unhealth, or we get used to it being, you know, not hitting on all the cylinders, and it's just how we, how we function. We just adopt the difficulty as normal, but I want you to know today that difficulty in marriage, while it may start that way, and while we may have, have pushback along the way, where there may be tension, it's not how it has to stay. There are solutions to the problem. We don't have to adopt bad communication. We don't have to adopt resentment. We don't have to adopt a lack of, of, of understanding or respect or love as normative in our marriages. My guess is a lot of married couples in here today know something's wrong, but they don't necessarily know what. They just know that it's, things aren't quite right. It's not all working like we thought it would work. And and in word today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the, the bottom line solution. And this is two parts, and next week's the last week of this series. And I thank you for your patience in this, especially if you're not married. And I hope that God has taken the information and the truth and applied it to relationships. Because really, truly, all of these truths are applicable to friendships or work relationships or neighbors or families. Most all of this is, has, has very, very clear application and this one for sure does so we're talking about solutions but today what we're going to do is talk about the bottom line solution that if this part of, so, of the solution is not at, at work in our marriage at least in, a, in, in one half at least in one half ideally in both if this is not present what we're talking about today we can't move forward there are more specific ideas of solutions in difficult marriages or, or marriages that want to go from good to great, but you can't move forward at all until at least one partner adopts this as their solution and their next step. As I said, at least, but ideally both. 
all right? Now, last week we said the fundamental problem in marriage is that husbands and wives have to battle against, we have to do battle against uh, the, our desire or our tendency to resist God's plan and to revert to our default settings as people and as husbands and wives. And default settings means the husbands ha- tend to default to passivity and wives tend to default to taking leadership. The exact opposite should be case. Actually, wives should never be passive, but husbands should take leadership. Wives should be actually anything but passive, but they should be willing to follow the husband's leadership. And that is so countercultural, it's almost scary to say in front of a group of people who could take it out of context and then use that as, uh, as ammunition to say that I'm some archaic, uh, you know, caveman mentality person where I say, me, man, you, wife, follow me. And that's not at all what we're trying to communicate. And in fact, as we talk about the different roles that God's word clearly articulates should be in place in marriage, there is nothing about value. There's equality in our value before God. There's equality in our value in marriage. There are different roles and distinct ways to apply those roles, but equality is true. We've acknowledged that many times inherently women would have a better or a more maybe a more natural uh, leadership ability, specifically in certain areas in marriage. That doesn't disqualify the husband from actually assuming the responsibility there and for the wife to assume the responsibility to, to, to nurture home, to nurture family, and to follow, husband, uh, follow the husband's leadership. Now, it, if it was that nice and neat, if it were that simple, we'd be done. But it's not that simple, is it? It's not that simple to work out the roles. It's not that simple to assign the roles and to adopt the roles and and to figure it out. It's it's just not. In fact, when you get down to the core, it can be really messy and very complicated. So today, we have to do a very good job of saying, here's the foundational response to the problems that are inherent in our marriage. Okay? Your your problems may be unique to you, but probably not. But I am going to tell you that the solution is not unique to you this part is universal and this part is universally being ignored it is huge so let's look at God's Word and answer the question where do we start in returning to God's original design for marriage I want you to turn to your Bibles turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21 we're gonna look at one verse today and one verse alone and it is the summation as you're turning there this is Paul's conclusion or kind of a concluding statement, a transition statement, about how relationships should work in the Christian life. And he's talking about relationships in general or as a whole in a bigger picture of, than just marriage. But he's, this is a transitional statement that he's going to take and apply specifically to marriage. Okay, so he, he gives these roles and he gives in relationships in general. He talks about how that should look. And then in Ephesians 5 and verse 21, I'm going to read it out of two translations. And I want you to stand today. Please stand in the honor of reading God's Word. He is going to be very specific, and this is, think of summation and transition when we read this. And so he says in the New Living Translation, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then in the New American Standard, he says, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Submit to one another, be subject to one another. Key, key phrases father take your word and give us clarity we do not want to assume anything nor do we want to impose our will or our desires or our understanding over yours we want to submit and be subject to your authority and to your wisdom and to your truth father keep me prevent me from saying anything that is out of bounds out of line with the correct and true teaching of your word i would never be so uh, presumptuous to assume that i am that intelligent but I am that desperate to depend upon the wisdom and leadership of your spirit. I give you glory today, God, as we yield to your word. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. The Greek word for submit is, uh, in, in general, the general definition is to be in subjection to, or, or to, it means to voluntarily place ourselves under the authority of another person. To submit or to be in subjection to another person means to voluntarily place ourselves under the authority of another person or to become subject to their leadership. Or if we take that 
and we apply that to the, both parties in the marriage or in relationships in general, here's what you would hear Paul saying. What that means is, is that we begin to, to willingly serve the best interest of the other party instead of constantly looking how we can serve our own interests. So whether it's a friendship or it's a work relationship or a neighborhood friend or a marriage or a father to a son or a daughter to a mother or a daughter to a father, however you want to break that out, all of this works out like this. You say in relationships, be subject to one another. Serve or live for or approach the relationship with the best interest of the other party instead of your own best interest at heart. Our default settings, if we went back and made them more general, and it would it amount to this. Because of sin and the infection of sin in our lives, the way we default, where we default to in relationships is selfish. I go, if I'm left to my natural human nature, I approach relationships selfishly. And that means I approach a relationship based on how it can benefit me. I begin to look at the other person and treat the other person in the context of how they can benefit me, how the relationship can benefit me. And that can get really ugly really quick. Or it can be subdued and more, and more uh, subtle in, in our approach to that. But just know this, the default setting for us in a relationship, marriage, or friendship, doesn't matter, is, to, is, is self. I want the best for me in the relationship. Now, Paul is trying to communicate to us the opposite. He is saying that the most basic and essential thing any person can do to make the relationships in their lives healthy and functional as possible is to adopt the attitude of submission to the other person, to adopt the attitude that I will approach the relationship with their best interest in mind and not my own. That feels inherently dangerous. When you do this, if you've ever truly done this, to lay aside your own interest of self-preservation, uh, maybe, or self-interest, to say, I won't worry about what's best for me, but I will approach the relationship for what's best for this person. And not so I can get them to serve me. It's not a manipulative tactic. That, that would be untrue to the original uh, context or the wording here. Submission means unconditional. It means to, or truly without, without an agenda serve the best interest of the other person. When I do that, things begin to change. And that begins to change when we have an attitude change. This is not about just doing something differently. This is not, you know, uh, put action into action and then hopefully your heart will follow. This has to be a change of your heart first and let the actions begin to follow that change of heart. So Paul says that in Romans. And he describes that, that change of attitude in Romans 12, verse 3. He says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, he's talking to the church at Rome, to everybody, not just married couples. He says, I say to everyone among you to not think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't think highly of yourself or that you don't have a good self-healthy self-image. Of course you do. You have to. No one should walk around thinking I'm the scum of the earth or I'm, I'm terrible or who would want to be friends with me or I don't know why you're married to me, I'm just nothing. He's saying don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. And, and what is in, what's packed into that statement is think of others first. Think of others before you think of yourself. And Paul teaches that in other places in Scripture. That's an attitude change where you put the best interest of another person ahead of your own best interest in your life. And that attitude of humility allows you to begin to change your actions authentically. So if you don't change your attitude and, and change the way you think, then your actions will always be manipulative. It is if you're really still thinking what's best for me, but I know I'm supposed to do this, but if I do this, maybe they'll do this. That is manipulative in a relationship, in marriage specifically. It's very manipulative and it's very self-focused. When you say, I'm going to do this nice thing for so-and-so, my husband, my wife, my friend, my teacher, my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, my son, or my daughter. I'm going to do this nice thing because really I want them to do this nice thing for me. That is selfish. The end result is I want you to do something for me, so here's how I think you can get, I can get you to do that. So that's not what Paul is saying. He's saying change the way you think, adopt an attitude of humility, and approach the relationship with that other person's best interest in mind. 
no relationship can go stronger no relationship can get healthier no relationship become more secure more functional apart from this indispensable attitude uh, or action and action submission uh, is a healthy thing it doesn't sound good it doesn't sound fun it doesn't it sounds kind of dangerous to us it, it sounds kind of like you're laying yourself down to be a doormat it sounds like you're opening yourself up to this vulnerable state that is too risky it sounds bad but in God's context and his teaching it is very very good and we can know that God's all on board with this because Jesus his own son submitted to the very need he's first he submitted to the father but then he even submitted to us as he laid down his life for us that was all for our best interest and not for his so Jesus paved the way and exemplified what this looks like Paul goes on to describe in this passage that we're going to look at next week very specifically what it looks like for a husband to submit or be subject to his wife and then he's going to also talk about very specifically what it looks like for a wife to submit or to be subject to her husband and some very clear needs that are going to be brought to the surface so next week that's where we're going to go this week we have to lay the foundation of mutual submission that it is a two-way street in an ideal world I know that no one in here lives in the ideal world I understand that some of you have talked to me through this week you've been very honest and candid and life is very messy right there is not an ideal situation or starting place in a relationship you're just going to have to look at God's Word right now and say all right here is the problem the problem is I don't naturally want to do what God wants me to do that's my, not my default setting so I have to choose to do that and in order to choose to do that I'm going to have to unconditionally surrender and submit to the best interest of my spouse to the best interest without a manipulative agenda without condition I give myself to live for the best interest of my spouse so Paul is talking about the fact that submission is a two-way street but it looks different for the husband than for the wife now let's talk about application let's talk about where does this meet us today what in the world do I do because so many of you are gonna say alright we know the problem uh, we know that we're supposed to submit to one another and live for the what, what does that look like in my life how do I do that what what is my, th my expectations how do I get that ball rolling in my life that sounds like such a huge chunk and the first thing I want to tell you is that you have to realize that you are in the vast majority if you're sitting here today saying I'm not really doing this I'm not really approaching my spouse in unconditional concern for their best interest a lot of what I do is for what I can get out of the relationship not what I can put into the relationship I'm telling you that that is a very broad very common reality in our relationships and again not just marriage okay so it's okay I just want us to be feel okay to be honest about where we're at so that we can be honest about what we need to do personally so here's here's the deal get this in your mind God's antidote for the default settings when I say default settings, oftentimes it sounds like we're hopeless. Like, you know, well, this is just what we do. This is what we default to. But God has an antidote for it. And the antidote for those default settings are the, res that is, are the results of our sinful natures of husbands and wives is to intentionally choose to submit to one another. So let's talk about intentionality. Let's do something on purpose. Think about your days and how little you get to do on purpose. All right? You may choose to brush your teeth on purpose and you may choose to eat breakfast you may choose to drive to work but think about all of the span of time in between the, the intentional choices that you make the things life is just coming at you and you're reacting and you're responding and you're not really getting to be intentional about so much of life whether it's an email that comes your way whether it's a phone call whether it's an illness whether it's a relationship that, that falls apart whether it's a whether it's a financial problem that you didn't foresee man so much of what happens to us we're not intentional about and we don't even get to be intentional about a lot of it it's just that we can choose to be intentional about what is most important and I'm telling you your marriage relationship is vital and we have to choose to be intentional about it so I would tell you this that the moment you stop intentionally choosing 
to serve the best interests of your spouse, you will revert to the default setting of self-focus. That you will. There's no in-between. There's no other way to live. 50-50 still means you're serving self 50% of the time. Now, I know that it's a process, and we'll be honest about the process, that it's, you know, you don't go from zero to 100. But the moment you stop choosing to serve the best interest you will start of your spouse, you will start choosing to serve your own best interest. The moment you, you do choose to serve the best interest of your spouse, you will crucify the flesh, you'll put it aside, you'll die to self, and you'll begin to live for the best interest of your spouse. And that is an amazing, amazing transformation in life. Now, for the wife, our default that we said is to tend to step in front of husband and take the leadership that happened in the garden. And yes, it, it is very apparent that, that Adam had gone passive long before that. Eve did not elbow her way to the front, okay? Adam was not fighting for leadership. Eve, Eve, Eve simply assumed a vacant role. It, it appears with all, all that the scripture says that Eve stepped into a vacancy. And that happens a lot. And you know, part of me honestly wants to say, well, of course. Somebody's got to take the leadership. Okay? The problem becomes when they step into the vacancy and then ins insist on staying there and won't let this husband assume leadership or resist it is a better way to say. Because I don't know any wives. That, I've actually never met a single wife who says, I don't want my husband to lead me. I've, I've not met, especially when that husband is in a healthy relationship with God and has been in a healthy relationship with his family. That is, that's very seldom said. But what happens is that where it becomes, that feels natural, it feels safe, it feels secure, that you're making decisions, and then the husband feels like, you know, this is okay. You know, things are clicking. I like this. But we have passive and leader reversed, and, and, it's, and it does harm. Now, for husbands, here's what happens is that we get, whether we get overwhelmed or whether we just get insecure, or whether we just get confused, I don't know why, but we just want to sometimes sit down and take the back seat and let what happens happen, and we create this vacuum of leadership. And God has made it so in a wife and a woman that, that that's, not, that's not acceptable to not have leadership. It's not, and it shouldn't be that way. But when we sit back and take the back seat, uh, oftentimes the, the, it'll be filled and should be filled, quite honestly. What's wrong is when we realize it, we just sit there and say, oh, yeah, God said that, but maybe you're right. Or we just don't say anything. Maybe we're just tuned out into our own world. And what, we, what husbands do is we go to our man cave and we stay there. And a man cave is a good place if you use it to restore, if you use it to process, if you use it to re-energize. But when you go into your man cave, whether it's a literal place or, a, or, or more of a mental checking out, when you go there and stay there and stay passive, then that's tragic. And then we shouldn't be surprised when we step back out of the cave, so to speak, and I'm not talking hours, I'm talking lifestyle. We step back out of that man cave and we find somebody else in the driver's seat. Why would we be surprised? Now, those are, those are idealistic. Those are simple statements that don't necessarily fit perfectly into our worlds. I know that. Okay, so let's use them for what they are as reference points and generalities. All right, so what do we do and when we say, all right, I want to submit to the best interest of my spouse, I want my spouse to be able to do that the same, but what do we do when I feel like this is going to be unilateral? What do you do then when you say, Pastor, you're preaching to me, okay? And I'm willing, I'm willing. But my, my wife, she's not going to do it. My husband, he's not there yet. What do you do when you have one party ready to submit and the other party not ready and maybe not even looking like they're close? What do you do then, Pastor? Because this mutual submission thing, that sounds great. I wish we could do it because I would love to surrender the best needs of my husband. I would love to live to the best interest of my, of my wife. But I feel like the moment that I bow down to serve them and give them my all, I'm going to get kicked in the teeth. What do I do then? I'm going to tell you something. 
It's not, it's not easy to say, but that is a rough situation. Okay? I'm not saying there's no hope, but that's hard. When, when one person is willing to submit, surrender, and live for the best interest, the other person's not. But you know what the Bible teaches? Do that. Do that. To bow low, to submit to the best interest of your spouse unilaterally. We, if, if we all sit in here today and say, I'll do it, when they do it, we will never do it. If you sit in here today and you say, I will pursue a healthy relationship with my spouse when they show interest, no one is ever going to get off to ground zero because it's very unlikely that we're all, that we have a majority of people or even uh, half where you're both at the same place in a readiness and a willingness to step forward. It's very unlikely. So that means somebody has got to say, God, I can't do this. But I know what I need to do, so you're going to have to give me the grace. You're going to have to give me the strength and the ability to surrender to the best need, best interest of my spouse. And if you do that, listen to me, please. If you can do that, and I'm going to tell you how in just a second, but if you can do that, if you can truly, one person can do that, it is oftentimes something that revolutionizes a marriage. When, when one of us becomes vulnerable enough to offer unconditional surrender to the other's best interest is very often a game changer in marriage. But hear, hear me, you can't do it alone. God's power is absolutely essential, of course, but you need some partners. You need a confidant, and you need some people in your corner. You need some people that you can vent to, not complain to, but talk about your struggles with honestly. You need some people that will pray for you, you need some people to lock arms with you and encourage you. You need some people that will let you be honest and real. And again, I'm not talking about somebody you can go to and bash your wife with or bash your husband with. I'm talking about a cheerleader, somebody who will say, you can do this. Go back and love them again. I'm praying for you. I hear you. I know it's hard, but better days are coming. If somebody in this room is sitting here in that position saying, I'm willing, but they are not, then I'm telling you, it can still change and should change and will if we can do it God's way. It may take time, and there may be tears, and it may be very, very challenging. But I'm telling you, if we can do this God's way, things will begin to change. The honest reality is, if, if, if we can get two people to do this in a marriage, we can get a husband and a wife to submit to each other, the door is wide open for the most incredible relationship you're ever going to experience on this earth. And nothing cannot, there's nothing that couldn't be overcome when two people look at each other in the eyeballs and say, I'm going to live for your best interest, period. Even when you don't do it for me, I'm doing it for you. Even when you fail, I will stick to my guns because guess what? You're going to fail too. So it's un- conditional it's without condition so you approach the marriage the antidote for the problem that we've laid out is to say unconditionally i'm living for your best interest please hear me i gotta say this one more time if you do this so that you can get your spouse to do it you're not doing it if you say i'm gonna live for your best interest so that I can get you to live for my best interest, you're not hitting the mark. And that will, utterly, that will only compound your problem. Okay, that's manipulative. So check your attitude and check your motives. Again, a trusted friend is so important here. If you say, I don't have that level of trust with a friend right now, then I want to offer um, uh, staff here, staff's wives, uh, elders, deacons, deacons, wives, elders, wives, find a confidant, okay? Get in the corner with somebody. Let somebody check your motives. This is gut check time. There is not a nice, tidy solution to marriage problems. There's not. It is, it is the most difficult thing to turn around because selfishness is at the core of our problems, and selfishness is brutally resistant to change in my life. I don't know. 
I don't know about you. I will tell you that these are all things that I am applying in my own marriage. Not always consistently and not always perfectly. These are all things that my wife is applying in our marriage. And we're seeing some great things happen. We've seen some incredible changes. But I want to tell you, it's never easy. This is not easy. But on the flip side, nothing is more worth it in terms of human relationships. You will have to fight and you will have to do the hard work or surrender to the inevitable. And the inevitable might be just coexistence. If you want that, then you can do that quite naturally. But if you want all that you hoped and dreamed marriage could be, it starts with submission to your spouse's best interests. Here's our challenge. I want you to, without discussing this, don't tell anybody unless you got a buddy or a friend that you need to help you brainstorm the idea. But I want you to think of one thing you can do this week that would be a, a distinct change and a step toward serving the best interest of your spouse. One thing. It could be doing the dishes when you've never done the dishes before. It could be starting to pick up your laundry. It could be, uh, uh, it could be uh, cooking uh, a favorite meal. It could be a thousand things, okay? Just whatever you look at and you think, all right, what would communicate to my spouse that I am intentionally thinking about their best interest? It may be sitting down and listening for the first time in a while. It may be turning off your phone at supper time. It could be a lot of things. But you think of one thing you can do. And when you do it, don't sit there and, and, and wait for an applause from your spouse, okay? Don't sit there, oh, I took out the trash. I'm going to sit at the table until they come back in, and they're going to say, you took out the trash, and I'm going to get points, and yay. And that is about you, okay? This is not about you. If you're doing it for kudos from your spouse, you have not listened to me, and I'm going to go beat my head against the cinder block wall. This is not about you. This is about them. So you do it as covertly as you can possibly do it because I want you to experience doing something without an agenda, without an expectation of it being reciprocated. Just do something for the best interest of your spouse. Now, if you notice when that's done, wonderful. But don't be surprised if your spouse doesn't notice it the first time. Because it may be so unexpected <laughs> that it just, they just miss it. Okay? And don't go, huh. If you go, huh, and I'm not doing that again, guess who you were doing it for? You tell me. Self. If you do it, and you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again, I promise, it'll begin to show. You do it because you love them and you want to serve them. Now, if, if you do notice and you want to brag or celebrate, put it on our Facebook page. Call us and let us put it on an email. Let's encourage each other. If you don't notice, no big deal. My guess is a lot of times in this situation, it's not going to be noticed the first time. You're going to do it again and find more ways and begin to take steps. And we'll talk more specifically next week. But begin to take steps that are intentional in serving the best interest of your spouse. Think about this, and I'm closing. Jesus modeled this for us. He had glory in heaven. He had no problems. He had all honor. The, the whole universe bowed and worshiped and adored him as rightfully so, but he stepped out of heaven, the Bible says, and he stepped into the mess and the muck and the mire of this world, and he didn't do it because it was going to be fun. He didn't do it because people were going to give him great accolades on this earth. He did it full well knowing that we were going to crucify him, spit on him, mock him, brutalize him, torture him. And he did that to serve your best interest. And your best interest was forgiveness of your sin. And he accomplished that. And that is the model that husbands follow. And that is the model that wives follow. He is our hero. He, set the pla he blazed the trail. And we have got to follow it. And he will empower us to do that if we let him. Okay? Listen. If you're not in a relationship with this King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the one who was the greatest model of selflessness, the one who gave everything so that he might have you, and we want to give you that message. And the message is turn away from your sinful, selfish nature and turn to place your faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Bible says if you do that, 
you to be born again. You can have a new life, a new start. And I'm going to ask you to do that. If you've never done that today, that you would turn away from sin and place your faith in Jesus. So I'm going to ask a couple of people on the spot. Nate and Shauna, I know you got a kiddo, but will you stand over here at the cross, right, right over there? Can you do that for me? If you can't, tell me, because I really am putting you on the spot. And then Bill and Frida, can, can, can you all stand at this one? Would that be possible? All right, let's just do that. And then if you need to, somebody to pray with you in these moments, somebody to just come alongside of you and just lift you up, and maybe somebody, if, if I think their little boy is so well behaved, he'll probably be just fine there, but if he, if he starts running down the hallway, someone fetch him for him, all right? But if you just want somebody to pray with you, would you go over there during this time? We're going to sing in just a minute. I'm going to pray, but then we're going to sing a song called White Flag. And that, that is an anthem of surrender. And we're going to ask you to just stay seated and listen and reflect during the first part of that. And then we'll have you stand and respond during the last part, okay? But let's just go to God right now and give everything to Him. God, right now, Your Word, I think, is clear. And Father, if I've misconstrued it in any way, or if I've presented it in a way that is not honoring to You, then I ask for Your forgiveness and that Your Holy Spirit would give clarity. But God, I know that You've called us to surrender to the best interest of our spouse. I know that that goes against every fiber of my human nature. But I know that when the Spirit of God in me rises up and gives me the power and strength to do that, that when I live for Kelly and I don't live for me, things are incredibly, incredibly better. And we love you, God, and I thank you for the answers that you've given us. Thank you for an incredible wife, an incredible family. I thank you for many good marriages in this congregation. Make them better for the ones that are struggling, for the ones that that have feel like they're just hanging on by a thread, that you would whisper, God, not whisper, but that you would shout great hope and affirmation to them today. And I pray that you would help us to wrap our arms around them, to meet them where they're at, to not offer simple, trite solutions, but to share the struggle and get alongside of them in the journey. That you would bless us as we seek to make homes and families and marriages better. It is in Jesus' great name we pray. Amen. Let's, let's just stay seated for a moment, and we'll just listen to the words of this.